Okay guys, so I've got a recording. We are in Ezekiel 39 tonight. Turn your Bibles open to Ezekiel 39 tonight. Last week, I'm gonna stay there, I'm gonna cue you for the video. It's gonna be towards the beginning now. We have a video clip as you can see back there. Da da da. Um, <clears throat> and I'll try and include the video clip in an email when I send it out. It'll be in the description in the YouTube link. All right, Ezekiel 39 tonight, and we're looking at the latter days, part de, for those of you who like French fries. I do. All right. Um, <clears throat> last week, guys, last week we started looking at future prophetic events. Now, I don't know where some of you guys are at with Bible prophecy in terms of what you know, what you're interested in, what you think about it. But remember, a third of the entire Bible is made up of Bible prophecy. So if you want to know God through his word, which is really one of the only ways to know God personally and really for who he says he is, you got to get to know Bible prophecy. Do me a favor. Keep your thumb there in Ezekiel 39 and turn over to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. I don't have a bookmark, so however long it takes me to get there. <clears throat> oh, and then I'm already there. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. When we, yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. Usually when we think prophecy, we think future. We think foretelling. People would call it predicting. Although God's prophecy is not predicting. He's not making educated guesses or hypotheses. Okay? He knows the future. He's just telling us what he already knows. But prophecy is more than just telling the future. Prophecy truly at its core is revealing who God is to the person personally. It's a revelation of God. Have you ever read things in the Bible many times before and then one time someone was teaching or you were reading it for the umpteenth time and all of a sudden this verse, this passage that you'd always read, heard about, known, seen before, all of a sudden it comes to life and you, you understand it in a way you never have before. Anyone relate with that? Some of you? Okay. Well, clearly some of you need to get more in tune with prophecy. Guys, Prophecy is more than just telling the future. Let me, let me just read from God's word so he can define it for, our, for us. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. One who prophesies speaks to men or people, that word men is mankind, for edification, exhortation, and consolation. Encouragement, building up, and comfort. Prophecy comforts. Prophecy builds people up. Prophecy encourages and motivates, not just by way of telling the future, but revealing and receiving really and personally who God is to you in a fresh way, a true way according to his word. I just want you to understand that prophecy is more than just future telling, foretelling. It's revelatory of who God is to you personally. Go ahead and flip back over to Ezekiel 39. And that is something I want you guys to keep in mind while we go through Ezekiel 39. This isn't just about the future. This is telling us, giving us another facet, another angle to who God is personally. That's why we read the word of God. It's not so that we can know the future. Okay, the Bible is not a crystal ball so that we can know what the future holds. You've heard the cliche. I don't know what my future holds, but I know who holds my future. It's all about God. Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Literally, I'm the beginning and the end. He created time. It's all about Jesus. So as we read through Ezekiel 39, ask yourself, what does this show me about who Jesus is? And how does who he is and what he's doing affect me? Because he made you. Not by chance, not by accident. You're very much intentional on purpose. So, we're continuing through Ezekiel 39, <clears throat> which is looking at a prophetic future event, which I believe is not too far on the horizon. And the reason for that is because a number of you said, Jake, if there was something I'd want you to teach out of the Bible, I'd like to know more Bible prophecy. So that's why we're here. <clears throat> he, 
he reveals this future event, this prophetic event through a prophet named Ezekiel. And as we saw last week, the people, the groups that are described in Ezekiel 38 and in 39, make up this future invasion that we're actually seeing come together already as we speak. These nations are in, are forming or already in a coalition, an agreement, a confederacy. These nations today that are described by ancient names in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are today's Russia, Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, all those, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iran, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Libya. A lot of nations here are represented. Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Never before in history, and I ought to know, because I got a degree in history. Never before in history have these three nations, these people, ever, ever gotten along. They've always fought and warred with each other. And yet, these three nations currently are sitting on Israel's doorstep in Damascus, Syria. You could actually see Russian troops with your own eyes if you stand at the northern edge of Israel. Wild stuff. Anyway, <clears throat> Russia, Turkey, and Iran, for the first time ever in history, are allies. That's a big deal in and of itself. It's never happened before. What I find interesting is how our world today is largely unaware of this forming coalition. These pieces, these prophetic puzzle pieces are coming together and the whole world is clueless. You'll see stories pop up about Russia and Syria or things happen in Libya or in Turkey, but no one's really looking at the bigger picture here except for, ironically, Christians, believers, Bible students, teachers, pastors, our world is unaware, but we are fast approaching the fulfillment of the prophecy we're reading tonight. So there's a couple questions to consider as we get into this. Does the rapture happen before or after this event? Now, if you're sitting here tonight or you're watching this and you're going, what in the world is the rapture? We'll talk about that. The rapture, in a nutshell, we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> If you, if you find 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, and read through, you'll see. In the English, it talks about how we as believers are caught up. The Latin translation is raptus, which is where we get the word rapture from. Some people have said, rapture is not even in the Bible. It is, if you're reading a Latin one. And if you want to know more about the rapture, I would highly encourage you to go on the Bridge Christian Fellowship's um, YouTube channel, and look up the last two Sunday's teachings. Pastor Rick's talk exclusively on the rapture, what it is, why it is, who it is, where it is, when it is. A couple questions to consider as we go into tonight's teaching. Does the rapture happen before or after this event we're reading about tonight? Is this before the tribulation or an event in the tribulation? Before, in the middle, or at the end? And how, here it is, how does this reveal who Jesus is? And how does this affect my life right now? Some questions to consider. But let's, let's first pray before we get into God's word. Lord, there's a lot of sensationalizing of prophecy. And I know myself in my own life, I have from time to time had an unhealthy fascination with prophecy because, well, like uh, all of us today, we always want the latest breaking news. We want to know what's happening before others do. But Jesus, this is not about telling the future. This is not about a crystal ball and being able to know what's happening in the future. It's about you and what you're doing. And you're calling us to be a part of who you are. You're inviting us to be a part of your life. So I ask, Lord, that you would reveal who you are personally to us through your word and what you, what you have prophetically told us through your word, especially here in Ezekiel 39. God, I ask that you would open up our eyes and give us hearts to receive a revelation of who you are, that this wouldn't just be gathering information, that this would be 
beyond an intellectual endeavor. We're not here to just get smarter. We're here to grow in wisdom. And wisdom comes by humbling ourselves under your authority and receiving from you your truth. Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So Jesus, we want to be near the Father. We want to come close to you. We want to know you, be with you, follow you, be a part of what you're doing. Show us, Lord, how we can do that through your word tonight. In your name, amen. Ezekiel 39, verse 1. And you, God says to Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against Gog, against Gog, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and I will turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel." Remember guys, Gog is not a person's name, it's a title like Caesar or President or Prime Minister. And these names, Magog, Rush, Meshach, and Tubal are ancient geographical names. They're describing a place. Any descriptions we get of these people as you know, characters, God gives us. But we wanna be careful not to try, again, read our times, our understanding into God's word. Let God's word illuminate our times. Don't interpret the Bible by our times. Let the Bible interpret our times. And to remove any doubt about where God says the remotest parts of the north are, well, to, I should say to remove any doubt about whether or not this is the region of what is today Russia, Central Asian nations. First of all, if you go north of Israel, you go to the far north, where are we looking at? In the uttermost parts, or the remotest parts of the north. I talked about it in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 last week, part one. These names, these ancient geographical names, everybody knows through history who we're talking about. So when you take who these people are and you consider where they come from, you're looking at a map today it's today's Russia, it's Central Asia, and all the other nations I mentioned last week. In Ezekiel 38, God said he put hooks in their jaws. Ezekiel 38, four, I will put hooks in your jaws. And he promised to bring them, not just against Israel, but note specifically against the mountains of Israel. This place today is called the West Bank. It's the mountain range east of Israel, or the eastern mountain range of Israel. And today it's mostly inhabited by Arabs. However, over recent years, Jews have been building up homes and neighborhoods, businesses, orchards. They've been spreading throughout the West Bank. They buy huge swaths of land at prices three, four, five times its value. They buy it legally, fairly, and wherever the Jewish people have settled in Israel, it flourishes, which is also another prophetic promise God said of his people. When he would regather them in the land, this land would be bountiful. You know, Israel is one of the largest suppliers of produce to Europe. One of the largest exporters into Europe of produce comes out of itty bitty Israel. Pharmaceuticals, Israel. Tech, Israel. Your cell phones, you can think of, Israeli Jews for those things. Seriously, do some research, check it out. God has blessed these people. <clears throat> All this to say, going back to the West Bank, many of the Jewish people in Israel, more and more of them, live outside of the border walls of Israel. If you don't know this already, Israel has a large wall that separates them from the rest of their neighbors because of continued, consistent, and increasing terrorist activity. Terrorists crossing the borders. So they said, you know what? We're gonna build a wall. And where there's not a wall, there's fencing. All that to say, as we saw in Ezekiel 38 last week, well, you know what? Go ahead and look over there. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse eight. After many days, God says to this Gog character and his confederacy, you will be summoned in the latter years, which is the end of the end times, 
you will come into the land, the land, speaking of Israel, that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but its people were brought out from the nations. They are living securely, all of them. You will go up, you will come up like a storm. You will be like a cloud. He says further down in verse 11, and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest that live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates. Today, that's happening. Lots of Jewish people are settling in the mountains outside of the walls and the proper borders of Israel. Anyway, it says here in verse 39 that God, I'm sorry, in chapter 39, God says, I'm going to turn you around in verse 2, and I'm going to drive you on and take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. This is the West Bank. Now, I'm just guessing here at this point. But listen to me on this, and especially you seniors or high school students who take current events. Maybe Gog and his coalition of nations, his confederacy, come in the name of defending Palestinians. We've seen that before. Arab neighbors have come in the name of defending the Palestinian people and attacked Israel. Hamas claims to come and fight for the Palestinian people, although they use their Palestinian people as human shields. It's really wrong, horrible. Hezbollah does the same thing. Maybe Gog, with his confederacy, comes in the name of defending Palestinians. But as we saw last week, his motivation is for wealth, to plunder Israel. And what would Israel have that Russia and his allies would want? We talked about that last week. Oil. Same old game we've seen over the last hundred years. Oil is the name of the game. Oil, natural gas. And Israel came upon this natural gas field called the Leviathan gas field, oh, 10 years ago at least. It's the largest natural gas reserve in the world. It dwarfs everything else. Yeah, I can't even picture that. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's gigantic. <laughs> it's massive. It's magnanimous. It's amazing. And no doubt, I'm sure Russia's like, huh, how can we get our hands on that? See, <clears throat> if they come in the name of defending the Palestinians, there's something you need to know about current history. World, the world has never truly cared about the Palestinians. They've been used to legitimize political players' plans to achieve goals for power and wealth. They've always been a pawn for people to get power, to dominate. Israel. Lastly, and it's super important to remember this, the Lord is doing this. Now, Gog and his confederacy, they think they're the ones doing it. But as we've seen through Ezekiel 38 and now through 39, this is all God's plan. He's orchestrating this. Think about this. God is intentionally bringing an overwhelming attack on his own people. God is. He's using the evil, insidious, selfish, and wicked desires of Gog and his power players to glorify himself. And we're going to see more of that tonight. Here's your first point if you take notes. I said this last week, but I think it bears worth repeating. Unusual methods of sanctification. God uses unusual ways to sanctify us and to glorify himself. Look at verse 3 with me. He says, I'll strike your bow from your left hand and dash your, down your arrows from your right hand. What he's talking about here is complete destruction. Okay. <clears throat> the bow and the arrow were the ultimate weapon of ancient warfare. Now, some of you might be like, what about the sword? I can give you story after story, historical account after historical account of mounted archers, waylaying swordsmen, knights even. Matter of fact, there's an ancient battle, it's not actually ancient, it's like medieval time, uh, battle in Seljuk over in eastern, southeastern Turkey today. Seljuk Turks drew out a bunch of knights. I think there was 120,000 Byzantines that met them out in the plains. And the Seljuks came out with just a small number and they came at them and they passed by them and circled back around and ran 
They hightailed it. It's called a fame. And as they ran away on their horses, they shot from their horses like this, nailing them from behind. But then they ran around a mountain. These knights, big, huge, hulking knights in their armor, come into this open mountain range, and all these Seljuks come out and descend upon them. Have you ever seen the movie Kingdom of Heaven with Orlando Bloom? Okay, you might have seen this in that movie. Salah Adin and his forces come out and circle the European crusaders and they're waylaying them with arrows from a distance. The weapon of choice in the medieval, or medieval and ancient world was a bow and arrow. You could destroy your enemies this way. God says, I'm gonna strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. I am gonna totally immobilize you and defeat you militarily. You'll have no strength. You'll have no power. Bow and arrows were also symbols of prowess, prowess and power in battle. God says, I'm gonna eliminate that. Revelation 6, 2, I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow. By the way, this is a depiction of the Antichrist and his unchecked power to dominate by military might. What does he come on a horse holding? A bow. Notice he doesn't have arrows. Why not? That's a teaching for another time but he comes wielding a bow, why? Because everyone understood bow and arrow, that was the method of ultimate weaponry, military power and prowess. Bow and arrows were used to the ancient world what missiles and bombs are to our time. Cruise missiles, laser guided bombs. We annihilated and just waylaid um, Afghani rebels, and why am I blinking out on who we fought in Afghanistan right now? What were their names? Anyone? Who'd we fight? What's that? Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda and the Taliban. Yeah. We hit them left and right. I mean, Osama bin Laden was hiding in the deepest, darkest cave for the longest of times. Why? Because our bombs and missiles were laying them out. Are you ready with that link, by the way? Okay, so... God promises here to completely wipe out God's military power and might. Now to understand, guys, what we're looking at here, I wanna give you guys some pictures, because we all like pictures, right? Pictures. <laughs> pictures, I mean, I like to read books with just words, but pictures are better, right? <laughs> okay, I'm just playing. Some of you guys look dead. You guys alive, you awake? Okay, all right, cool. Anyway, maybe I'm just not that funny, that's probably the truth. To understand what we're talking about tonight, I wanna to show you guys the following clip. And this clip talks about Israel's security needs. Israel, in its narrowest part, is only nine miles wide. Their country is nine miles wide at the narrowest part. And you're going to understand here, pay attention, you're going to understand here. Go ahead and blow it up and get it ready. And could someone hit the lights for me? Jarrett, you, you got it, Jarrett? Go for it. What a gentleman. You're going to understand why the mountains of Israel are so significant to Israel's defense and uh, existence. So whenever you're ready, Susan, roll that footage. I don't think that's it though. Wait, wait there's something else playing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm in Israel, but it sounds like the West. There we go. Oh, we like the West. All right. Pay attention, guys. Check it out. Every state has the right of self-defense and to secure borders to protect itself from hostile invasions and terror. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab countries 650 times its size, some of which are large bases of global terror. Only 44 miles separate between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. 44 miles, guys. After the Six Day War in 1967, when Israel was attacked by four armies on three fronts, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 stated, that Israel was entitled to new defensible borders to replace the previous fragile lines from which it was attacked. What are Israel's defensible borders? What are its essential security needs? The Jordan Rift Valley, 
Israel's eastern frontier forms a natural barrier between Israel and the countries of Jordan, Iraq, and Iran. The Jordan Valley rises from an area that is 1,200 feet below sea level to a hilly ridge of up to 3,000 feet, creating a steep 4,200-foot virtual wall opposite any force attacking from the east. The growing threat of global jihad activity near Israel's borders requires it to prevent infiltrations of terrorists and weapons. When Israel left the Philadelphia corridor in Gaza, it became a highway for the infiltration of terrorists and the flow of hundreds of tons of ammunition and weaponry from all over the Arab world aimed at Israeli civilians. The Jordan Valley is the equivalent of Gaza's Philadelphia corridor in the West Bank. To defend itself, Israel must retain control over the Jordan Valley. This is Israel's mountain ridge, rising up to 3,000 feet. It dominates Israel's major coastal cities, where more than 70% of its population, 80% of its industry, and all of its airfields and seaports are located. Missiles launched from the Judean hills pose an immediate threat to Jerusalem, Israel's capital. Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion, would be in the range of even primitive rockets while all planes taking off and landing would be threatened by shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles. More advanced weaponry would be able to hit virtually any point in Israel. If Israel were forced back to the 1949 armistice lines, the Green Line, the country's width would be reduced to a narrow nine-mile waistline that would be impossible to defend. That's why any future arrangement must include Israeli control over key areas of the mountain ridge and the demilitarized Palestinian state. Israel's narrow borders means a combat aircraft can cross the entire country in under four minutes. In less than two minutes, an enemy plane could penetrate the country's airspace via the Jordan Valley and reach Jerusalem. In order to thwart an aerial attack on Jerusalem, a hostile plane must be shot down at least 10 miles east of the capital to prevent it from crashing into major population centers. Therefore, Israel must be able to identify hostile planes before they cross the Jordan River and intercept them shortly after. To defend itself, Israel must control the airspace over the West Bank. Israel's transportation arteries, and in particular, the Trans-Israel Highway, enable travel and connection between Israel's regions. They also assure the mobility of the Israel Defense Forces in case of attack. Protection of these vital arteries is essential in order to ensure that, one, civilians aren't victims of terrorist gunfire. Two, regions of the country cannot easily be cut off. Three, the mobility of Israel's defense forces is not hindered in the case of invasion. To defend itself, Israel must control its main arteries of transportation. There is enormous uncertainty about future trends in the Middle East. Iran is determined to become the supreme power as the U.S. withdraws from Iraq. No one can guarantee the future of many of the current regimes in the region. Today, more than ever, it is crucial to ensure defensible borders for Israel. Thanks, Jarrett. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I put that together, 2015. Oh, the light! I know. Well, I'm kind of a ventriloquist, but, you know, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's all about today's modern Israel. That's about understanding, by the way, just for modern history, if you're like, Israel's a big bad guy, did you see how small Israel is in the Middle East? And this is why it's important that they have the land that they have just to defend themselves. But the reason I wanted you to see it is so that you could see what Israel looks like geographically. And you saw the mountains of Israel there. God says he's gonna bring Gog down against the mountains of Israel. He'll strike down Gog's bow and arrow from the left and the right hand. In verse four, he says, you will fall on the mountains. 
You guys remember, you just saw where the mountains of Israel are. You and all your troops and the peoples who are with you, I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open field, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. A couple things here. The Lord promises, the Lord promises Gog and his coalition won't even get into Israel's heartland, which by the way, from the film you can see, shouldn't be hard. We're talking about Russia, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Djibouti, and Libya. Ma yeah, you're like, Djibouti? That's a real country. Guys, massive. Just Russia in, its, in itself. Russia in itself could overwhelm Israel. Russia's not enough. Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, all the Central Asian countries, which are huge, they're going to descend upon Israel right there on the mountains. You know, in the Six Day War, everyone was like, wow, the IDF is an incredible military machine. And they are, they're incredible soldiers. 1948, man, the Israeli Jews proved they are rugged, tough warriors. But in this Gog invasion, there won't be any hope in the world for them to defend themselves. I don't care how strong they are, they're not gonna defend themselves. And as we saw from last week, Sheba, Dedan, Tarshish, all of Israel's allies are gonna go, hey, Gog, are you doing this? That's it. They're just gonna like ask questions and protest. Are you actually doing this? No one will be there for Israel. And Israel won't have a hope in the world to defend themselves. God promises they won't even make it into the heartland. They'll die on the mountains. Now, where does the Lord specifically say he'll destroy Gog? I already said it. But what's interesting here, and remember what I said in the beginning, we read God's word to know who he is, what he's about. Why is he doing all this? And why Israel? God ends with this, for it is I who have spoken declares the Lord God. God says, I've said it. When God says something, he promises, he declares something, you can take it to the bank. You can take what God says to the bank with your life. Who or what makes all of this so absolute and certain? He says, the Lord God. The word Lord is Adonai. That just means Lord or Master. But the, the name God in Hebrew is Yahweh. It's not just any God. You see bumper stickers on people's cars. I remember when I first saw him down in Bakersfield, early 2000s, say, say coexist. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Islam and Judaism, coexist. Uh-uh, not gonna happen. This isn't any God. This isn't whatever God you wanna make him. This isn't the God that everybody knows. He is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the Lord God, the Lord Yahweh. And God's word and God's promises, guys, are as certain as history's past. What he says is as final and absolute as the things that have already happened. The history has already happened. You can't change history. It's done. No matter how much history revisionists would like to change and reinterpret what happened in the past. The past is the past and it's done. You can't change it. That's how sure and final God's word is. And that's your next point. And I want you to hear this one. His promises are perfect in power. God's promises are perfect in power. God's word is certain. And why am I stressing this? Because how many things right now in our world feel certain? Man, what is tomorrow? The inauguration? A lot of people are in, uncertain about tomorrow. Some of you have probably heard about it, read about it, watched things on YouTube about it. What's going to happen tomorrow? Nobody knows. What's going to happen in the next four years? Nobody knows. Lydia came in tonight. She's like, are we going to go to camp? I don't know. But you know what I do know? I know who Jesus is. 
And I know what he says and what he does is 100% verifiable, dependable with your very life. Jesus doesn't disappoint. He doesn't disappoint anybody who trusts in him and believes what he says. Look at verse six with me. God continues on. He says, I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in, anybody? The Holy One in, ha <laughs> yeah, you weren't paying attention, nice try. Jesus was not the right answer, in Israel, yeah. The Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is coming and it will be done, declares the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. The defeat of Gog and his confederacy will be so complete and so final, not only will the invading army be wiped out, think about this, not only will the invading army be wiped out, by the way, where's the invading army gonna be wiped out at geographically? Huh? Yeah, nice try, pay attention, anybody. I, I'm not up here to talk to myself. I can read this on my own in my own time. Where does God promise Gog and his invading force is going to fall? There you go. The mountains of Israel. But God goes on. He doesn't just promise Gog and his invading force will def be defeated on the mountains of Israel. Gog's land. Where's Gog's land? Russia, Central Asia, the remotest parts to the north. It will be devastated too. How? Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. He says, I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. That word safety literally is a picture of people like this. Meh. Oh, poor Israel. Meh. God says, I'm sorry. These are my people. And the whole world's going to hear about it. And the whole world's going to know that because Israel's important to me, they ought to be important to them. And I affect the nations of the world. Coastlands, that word coastlands implies all of Gog's allied nations too. All of North and Central Asia. All of the nations that I mentioned are gonna be what? Have fire. He said, I will send fire upon. Fire. What kind of fire? We'll get there in a second. Point is, Russia and Central Asia will never bounce back from this defeat. Guys, Adolf Hitler, go back further. Napoleon Bonaparte came in, tried to take out Russia and learn you never invade Russia in the wintertime. Bad idea. What did Adolf Hitler do? Invade Russia in the wintertime. But Russia's not gonna get invaded. Russia's gonna invade Israel. And God is going to so utterly destroy them, the nation will never come back. They'll never bounce back from this. Imagine with me right now, if these nations I mentioned, Russia, possibly Germany, Ukraine, Central Asian countries, Turkey, Iran, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Libya, Sudan, Ethiopia, on and on. Imagine if all of these nations in the world just collapsed. Imagine what kind of effect that would have on the rest of the world. Imagine that. And please don't joke about it because it is serious and it is gonna happen. It's not funny. What does God repeat is the motivation for all of this? What's the motivation? His motivation, he says it right here. Verse seven, look at verse seven with me. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. One of his motivations is, I want Israel to know I am their God. I am real. You know that over 80% of Israeli Jews today don't believe in God. Even rabbis don't actually pray to God. Who do you pray to at the Western Wall? I don't know. It's like this cosmic prayer. We just throw up prayers to the universe. In this day, he says, I'm going to make who I am known to my people Israel. What's another reason? I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. By the way, side note, 
Ever since I was a kid, I was raised this way, and I want to put this to you guys. God says it throughout the Old Testament, and Jesus reiterates it in the New. God's name is to be held with respect. And I hear a lot of people use God's name in vain. I was working at the refinery before I worked here at this church, and there was a young guy who worked there, and he always took God's name in vain. He didn't know God, so, you know, what can I expect? But pretty soon I, <laughs> I thought of a way to get him to just realize what he's doing and saying. And so he'd yell out Jesus' name. He'd hit his hand or mess up. And i go, what? Where? He's like, huh? I said, you just said Jesus really loud. Yeah? So where is he? Okay, Barksdale, real funny. He kept on saying that. I'm, and so finally one day I just yelled his name out. I can't remember his name. But I'll just make up a name. Matthew! He's like, huh? What? What? You said my name. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. I just messed up over here that I'm really ticked. Like, whatever. We go back to the job. Dude, Matthew! What? What? You just said my name. No, I didn't. <laughs> I said, bro, honestly, I know you don't know Jesus like I do, but I love him, and I only call on his name when I want to talk to him. So let that be for what it's worth. And he said, okay, I respect that. And he thought twice before he called his name. Matter of fact, before I left that work, he asked me to pray with him. What's one of God's motivations for this? He doesn't want people to take his name in vain. He doesn't want people to take his name and just treat it like it's some ordinary byword. This is the God of the universe who made the universe both known and unknown, and we throw his name around willy-nilly like a byword in movies and TV shows. We use it like a curse word. He says no more. Another motivation, that the nations will know that I am the Lord. I am the Holy One in Israel. These are the motivations for why God does what he does. Here's your next point. Israel is central to God's prophetic plans. I said it last week, and I want to repeat it again. We live over here in America, and we live like America is the world. Well, it's not. And America is not the apple of God's eye. He loves the church, but America is just one nation and a long string of history of nations, and there will be nations after us, although I don't think it will be a long line. Israel, though, has been a prophetic promise from God so that he could reveal who he is to the whole world. It's not that the Jewish people in Israel are somehow better. He chose to use a nation of people to reveal who he is to the rest of the world. Israel is central to God's prophetic plans. Now, pick up at verse 9 with me. He goes on and says, Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years, they will make fires of them. Seven years. What kind of weapons burn for seven years? They will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forests, for they will make fires with the weapons, and they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. This is kind of a recurring theme in Israel's history too. What happened at the end of Israel in Egypt, when God rescued them out as slaves, God said, not only am I going to take you out, but I want you to go ask your slave owners to give, them all, to give you all of their valuable possessions. The slaves ended up plundering their overlords and slave masters without lifting a weapon. That's the power of God at work through his people. It's amazing. The devastating death here, guys, described will be overwhelming. It will take seven months to dispose of the dead. The wreckage of God's wrath will give Israel seven years worth of fuel for fire. Pay attention to this. Seven years they'll be burning the weapons left over from their invading enemies. And for seven months they'll be burying the dead around the clock. They'll be burying this massive horde that tried to take them over. Now, 
Here's a question for you, you Bible prophecy students. Where else does this seven year span of time pop up in scripture? Where does that ring a bell? Yeah, Ben. Revelation, yeah, Kevin got it too. Some of you are like, that sounds an awful lot like the Revelation. The Revelation, yeah, it's a Revelation. It sounds an awful lot like the seven year tribulation. Daniel chapter nine, verse 24. God tells Daniel this. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people, Israel, and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement, atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 is a poor translation. 70 weeks is a poor translation. It's better literally translated 70 sevens. Actually, the language here isn't talking about weeks. It's actually talking about years and spans of seven years. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 describes 62 spans of seven years. Math students, 62 times 7 is anyone? I'll give you time. Close. And now you're just guessing. It's okay. I'm not a math student. I had time to do this. 62 times 7 is 483 years. I am not. I'm a history guy, not a math guy. Shh. Because I had all day. <laughs> I had time to just punch it into a calculator. Plus, shh. Plus 483. Okay, divide, divide 483 by seven. Divide 483 by seven. Divide it and just give me the answer anyway. Thank you, because it's 70 weeks. I, yeah, I forgot because it's 62 plus the, because there's a span of time in between, it doesn't matter. You don't need to know the history. But this is why you read the Bible for yourself, because Jake can get it wrong. Thank you, Connie and Susan. 483 years is 69 spans of seven years. God said 70 sevens. So what happened to that last seven years? These first 69 years or 69 sevens have been fulfilled with Jerusalem. First, when Jerusalem was first being rebuilt under the Persians, all the way up to its destruction in 70 AD, down to the very day. I don't have time to get into this. Some of you are like, whatever. Guys, God prophesied this in Daniel 9 before the Persians ever took over Babylon. This is future even to Daniel's time. And he said, when the issue is decreed to rebuild Jerusalem, that's when his prophetic watch starts. And it continued ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking. And then talks about the Messiah being cut off from the people. And then there was another span of time after that. But when Jerusalem's holy place was destroyed, desolated, the prophetic watch, thank you, stopped. It stopped, leaving seven years left on the prophetic time clock. When does it begin again? Daniel chapter nine, verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. He is speaking of the Antichrist. And this firm covenant is an absolute peace treaty. With the many, the word many is goyim, which means the nations, the world. This Antichrist is gonna make a peace treaty with the whole world and it's revolving around Israel. Why? because I believe what we're reading right now in Ezekiel 39. Imagine when this huge horde descends upon Israel and no nation stands up to defend Israel. And then supernaturally, fire, brimstone, blood wipes them out without any human agency. What do you think the world's gonna think? What do you think the world's gonna do? Let me ask you this. What has the world been doing right now can you guys hang on? 
What has the world been doing right now during COVID? Guys, we got the World Economic Forum. We got the World Health Organization. We got world powers coming together trying to figure out how do we get this whole thing under control? That's from COVID. Imagine what's gonna happen when this unfolds. It goes on, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. By the way, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. You can't put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering unless you have a temple to provide sacrifice and grain offering in. There's no third temple right now in Jerusalem. But even as I talk to you tonight, there are people and organizations in the works right now of trying to get that third temple rebuilt. When you see, should we see, I should say, should we live long enough to see that third temple built? Man, you better be living on the edge of your seat because that's, that's, that's one of the pivotal pieces that's gonna re be required for the Antichrist to do what he does. What does he do? He says, one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. He will perform what's called the abomination of desolation. What's that, Jake? Talk to me another time, because that's not for tonight's teaching. Anyway, he starts the final countdown of the seven-year period foretold in Daniel 9.24, when he makes a firm covenant. He makes a peace treaty with the world, and it centers around Israel. When he makes that peace treaty, that's the final seven years of the world as we know it. Jesus describes this in Matthew 24 and what we've come to know as the tribulation. All this said, guys, go back to Ezekiel 39, verse 9. How long will they burn the weapons for? Seven years. I don't find that coincidental. Guys, I've thought for a long time. I've thought for a long time that the church would still likely be around when this whole war breaks out. I don't think that anymore. As I read more closely and compare God's promises to others he's made from his word, I believe the church will already be taken at this point. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 talks about how the church is gonna be taken out. Imagine you go to bed tonight and you wake up tomorrow morning and people in your household are gone. You start looking for them. You call neighbors, friends, you get on Facebook, and everybody in the town is saying the same thing. People they know and love are gone all of a sudden. Turns out it's not just here, it's Washington, it's all of the United States. The whole world is dealing with the fact that a whole bunch of people have disappeared like that. Why do I think that's gonna happen before this war we read about tonight happens? Three reasons. It seems this burning of weapons coincides with the seven year tribulation. Because, as we know, the Antichrist will come on the scene starting a seven year peace with the world centered around Israel. I'm curious, what usually compels nations to make peace treaties? War. After World War II, there were treaties signed. After World War I, Treaty signed. After the six day war in Israel, treaties signed. Why? Because we want to put an end to war. War costs lives, money, and it can totally destroy nations and civilizations. Interesting. Here's point number three God repeatedly says, My people Israel. He says it in 38 verse 14. He says it in 38 verse 16. He says it again in 39 verse 7. Where's the church? He says, my people Israel, my people Israel. Where's the church in all of this? Ezekiel 39, verse 11. Pick up with me in verse 11. On that day, I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will block off those who would pass by. So they will bury Gog there with all his horde, and they will call it the valley of Hamon Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Cleanse the land is an important phrase. Even all the people of the land will bury them. 
and it will be to their renown on the day that I glorify myself, declares the Lord God. You think Israel was renowned after the Six-Day War? In six days, Israel defeated six much larger nations than themselves all in one fell swoop. That's going to pale in comparison to this defeat. But Israel won't be responsible for this win. He goes on, he says, They will set apart men who will constantly pass through the land, burying those who were passing through, even those left on the surface of the ground, in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. As those who pass through the land pass through and anyone sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. And even the name of the city will be Hamanah, so they will cleanse the land. This is interesting. There's a lot of description given to this whole burying process. Some have hypothesized this is the description of nuclear war and fallout. Maybe. There's going to be a kind of hazmat team employed. They're going to pick out certain people and they're going to create a team of people to systematically go through and dispose of the dead. They're going to set up markers to identify human remains that are left for burial. And thirdly, it sounds a lot like how Russia handled the nuclear fallout and a catastrophe in a place called Chernobyl, Ukraine. You don't know about it, maybe, because it was long before you were alive. I was itty bitty when it happened. Yeah. What's your point? Well, it was in 1988, Jake, and that was a long time. You mean you were alive before then? Yeah. <laughs> 1988, I think. It was somewhere in there. Someone can fact check me, I'm sure, tonight. The point is, if you go look it up, <laughs> that wasn't a jab at you guys. I appreciate you checking my math. Guys, it sounds a lot like what is being described here are the results of nuclear fallout. Guys, the only other time nuclear bombs have been employed in war was in World War II, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And the whole world said, never again. What? But hang on a second, hang on. I'm not saying this isn't nuclear war. However, I wanna give you two things to remember here. We so easily want to scientificize what God says supernaturally. Yeah, that's a made up word, not very intelligent, whatever. For example, the Red Sea. Some of you have maybe watched the documentaries. They've scientifically tried to explain away the supernatural. Well, yeah, you know, scientifically, possibly, there could have been a strong wind that came in and, come on, man, a body of water in the sea was blown apart and made land dry so that three million Hebrew slaves could walk through it. There's no scientific explanation for that, but we try and scientifically make sense of it because, well, the supernatural is just too beyond us. I wanna point something out here. I'm not saying that this might not include nuclear warfare. However, first, God says the world will see this clearly as his doing. The whole world's gonna go, this was supernatural. This was an act of God, and not any God. This was the God of Israel who did this. And secondly, death in Jewish culture is an, is an important thing. It's a significant thing. You see throughout the Old Testament, things mentioned about uncleanness. God doesn't want his people to be unclean. In Numbers 19, 16, God says, anyone who in the open field touches one who has been slain with a sword or who has died naturally or a human bone or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. Death, exposed death is unclean and any Jewish person who touches anything related to death is then made ceremonially unclean. Being unclean is a big deal. This massive burial site here is a memorial and it's going to be called Hamon Gog, which literally means the multitude of Gog. Mom, dad, what's this? Oh, this is a massive memorial where millions of people died. How did that happen? God killed them. And apparently a city of memorial will exist to remember what God did. There's going to be a city devoted to the upkeep 
of this memorial burial ground. Anyway, look at verse 17 with me. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field and assemble and come. Gather from every side to my sacrifice. What does he call it? To my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you, birds, as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted and drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. You will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the nations. There it is again. Set my glory among the nations and all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed and my hand, which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. The nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me. And I hid my face from them, so I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword, according to their, here's the word, uncleanness, and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. The world is gonna know why the Jewish people were scattered across the earth. And it wasn't because he wasn't real, and it wasn't because he didn't love his people Israel, it was because of them. But hang on, we're not going to end the story there. We're going to pick up at verse 25 here in a minute. God's going to supernaturally defeat Israel's enemies. And every kind of meat-eating bird in the region is going to gather to eat the flesh of this massive military. Here's your next point. And it's really a question. Listen to this. Bird bait or the bride's banquet? Which one do you want to be a part of? Revelation 19.8 it was given to her, this is talking of the church, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, God said to John, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said, these are true words. I do not believe, based on what we've all read from scripture, that the church will be on earth to witness the battle, the war that we just read. And if you guys think this world right now is messed up, can you imagine how messed up it's gonna be during the tribulation? God, Jesus actually said, God limits the duration of the tribulation because if he didn't, not a single human being would be left alive. No one could survive through it if he didn't cut it short. You and I have a choice tonight. I don't know what's gonna to happen to you tonight when you leave or tomorrow or this next week. I don't know what's gonna to happen to me. Based on what we've all read from scripture, guys, we have a choice. Do I wanna be part of this world during these horrible things that unfold? Or do I wanna be with Jesus? I'm gonna ask you a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. But in these last 10 months, have you felt insecure? Have you felt bothered, discouraged, depressed, angry and hopeless all at the same time? Do you want more of that? Or would you rather be with Jesus where there's perfect safety, perfect peace, absolute joy, and you get to enjoy it all with him, with no end. I'm gonna read this last section here in verse 25. Therefore, so, thus says the Lord God, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob, that is Israel, and I will have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. They will forget their disgrace and all their treachery which they perpetrated against me when they live securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid. Listen to this. He's giving description of a certain time. When I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I will be sanctified through them in the sight of the many nations. 
Then they will know that I am the Lord their God because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gathered them again to their own land. And I will leave none of them there any longer. And here it is. I, shh, I will not hide my face from them any longer for I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. What I just read in this last, last section is a time after the rapture. Actually, it's after the seven-year tribulation. And how do I know? Verse 29, what does God say he will do? He's going to pour out his spirit on all of Israel. When has this happened? Never. Matter of fact, during the great tribulation, Zechariah 13, verse 8 through 9, foretells two-thirds of all of Israel will die. Two-thirds. And at this point in future history, all of the Jews in the world will have come back into their land. Right now, there's a major push. More and more Jewish people are fleeing to go to Israel. Why? Because Israel's the only safe place for a Jew to live in this world. It's becoming more and more that way. Now, if two-thirds of all of Israel dies, how many people are we talking? Okay, Jake, you're really good at math. Well, I looked this one up and I just wrote the statistic down. Right now, there are almost 15 million Jewish people alive on the earth, not just in Israel, across the earth. If what we read in Zechariah 13, 8 happened today, more than 10 million Jewish people would die. Six million of them died in the Holocaust. The Holocaust would pale in comparison to this. It's the Jewish people who survive through the Great Tribulation. Guys, there are gonna be Jewish people who suffer and survive through the Great Tribulation that will see God's sunlight at the end of it all. Israel has some very difficult and amazing times ahead for their people. Do you want to be around for that? Yeah, I'm right there with you, Josiah. No way. No way. Tonight, for some light reading before you go to sleep, go read Revelation 6 through 19 and see what happens to this world. But it's after he takes the church out and then God pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. We have time right now. God is offering grace he wants to give us salvation. He wants to rescue us out of this messed up place called the world so that we can be with him forever. But that choice is ours. You don't want to be around, guys, when what we read tonight and the things after that begin to unravel and happen. Jesus offers hope. Jesus tonight offers rescue from all of this if you'll accept his forgiveness for your sins. If you'll choose to live a new life with him and for him, Jesus wants to save you. Jesus wants to love you if you'll let him. Would you go ahead and bow your heads with me tonight? And I'm going to pray. We'll have some time to ask questions and talk about this teaching in a minute. But please bow your heads and close your eyes. And this, is, this goes for anyone who might watch this video later on on the World Wide Web. If you're listening to this and you go, you know what? I've grown up in church. I know lots about God. Hey, your eyes down, heads down. I don't want you guys looking at anybody else. Eyes closed, heads down, thanks. Maybe you've been going to church your whole life, but can you confidently say, I know that when Jesus raptures the church, I'll go home with him. If you're not confident of that, or maybe you just flat out know, you know, I know a lot about this. My mom and dad talk about it, but I've never actually chosen to believe this for myself. Then listen and repeat this prayer after me. If you want to make tonight a certain night where you know without a shadow of a doubt, if you were to die, you would go home with Jesus. Then pray this prayer after me in your heart. And then when you're done, after tonight, come talk to me. Pray, let's pray together, guys. Jesus, I just want to thank you for tonight and for your word. And um, I thank you that you know the future. You know it so well. 
and you tell us what's coming, not so that we can plan our lives and uh, <laughs> know what kind of bets to place, but Jesus, you tell us about the future so that we know you are God. There is no one like you. And yet for all your incredible, majestic power and supremacy, you love us so personally and so intimately and so humbly. If there's anyone here tonight who wants to give their life to Jesus, then just repeat this after me as I pray. Jesus, I realize that I have sinned against you and the punishment for that is eternity separate from you in a place called hell. And I don't want that. And I recognize that you are God, that you made me, and you made me to have relationship with you. Lord, please forgive me for my sins, for my unbelief. I accept your forgiveness for my life, and I give my life to you to live with you and for you from here on out. And if you prayed that prayer, please come talk to me. And if you watch this later online, email me. Lord, for the rest of us, I ask God that we would live our lives with, that we wouldn't live our lives just going through the motions, but that we would know we're living in the latter days. Time is running out. And you're incredibly patient, but at some point that, patient will, that patience will stop. Help us, God, for those of us who know you, to take this seriously and know that there are people in our lives who don't know you and time is running out for us to share who you are with them. Would you compel us and control us with your love that we would show who you are to our neighbors and our friends and anyone who would wanna hear about you. Father, thank you for your word and I ask that you bless our discussion here in just a second. In your name, we thank you for all these things, Lord. Amen.